Hello friends, this is Reverend David from Christian Path Ministries of Pennsylvania, and welcome once again to The Christian Path. I hope you're well, and that today's message, an ultimate gift, will open our eyes as to what gifts really are, what they should mean to us, and especially the one ultimate gift that we were all given and that many have no idea about. Now, first of all, we've all given gifts, we've received gifts, but what is a, quote, gift? I think we all know. I don't think I have to look it up in Webster's Dictionary so that we can get a precise definition. We all pretty much know that a gift is an offering or a present, a contribution. A lot of other nouns would be in there, but we know what it is. It's when someone gives us something or we give somebody something for a specific reason or occasion with no repayment at all. We just want to give somebody something some type of a present and say, here, this is yours. I'm giving it to you because I want to. It's yours. It's free for any specific reason, like a birthday. You get somebody a gift or you get one, a baby shower. You buy a gift, graduation, gift, wedding, gift. You get the idea. We know what gifts are. They're presents. And let's face it. Let's be realistic here. Some gifts that we receive aren't really all that great. Now, when I give gifts, personally, I'm the type of person I like to give really nice gifts. That's just the way I am because I get a kick out of seeing the person's expressions, seeing their reactions when I give them something and it's like, whoa, you know, but sometimes we receive gifts that aren't really all that great. When we're kids, we all have certain things that we want, gifts for certain occasions. For example, when I was a kid, I would see all these commercials, like especially around the October, November, December period there, and we know why, because it was Christmas time, and I would be watching all these commercials between the cartoons of all these different toys. Basically, they're trying to snag the kids into getting mom and dad to buy it for them, and there was this one item I really had to have as a kid. It was weird. It was big, and it was an action figure. It was strong. It was mean-looking. It wasn't a well-known Marvel comic character or anything like that, like Superman or Batman or Spider-Man or anything. It was just, I forget the name of it, but it was a really cool-looking thing. It looked sort of robotic. It had a mean-looking face. It was built like a wrestler. It was strong. And you know what? In these commercials, it was walking. It was firing weapons. It was driving all these funky-looking machines and all these weird looking vehicles to save the world this character did unbelievable things and i had to have one i had to have one of these superheroes and of course i mentioned it and i kept bringing up little hints i'd be able to control the universe i could be a hero through this superhero through this character all the incredible things i could do were unbelievable in my mind So then my birthday came, I'm opening my presents, and you know how kids are, and they're opening presents, I was looking for this, there he was, there was this action figure, I was thrilled, now I was going to save the world, I was going to be a hero, so I took the thing out of the box, and out of all the packaging, and you know what it was, it was a rubber figure with wires in it. Sure, you could bend it and it would stay, kind of like a Gumby, if you remember them. But it didn't do anything. It didn't drive vehicles. It didn't shoot weapons. It wasn't walking through the city, killing the villains. It did nothing. It was a rubber doll with wires in it. So you know what it did? It looked really good sitting on my shelf in the bedroom. And that's where it was until I became a teenager and got sick of looking at it and eventually threw it out. Now, what about gifts that other relatives give give you? For example, like an older relative, especially. Like I had, when I was young, I had a grandmom. Like when I got into my teens, my grandmom is in my, in her 80s, uh, getting, you know, close to 90. I had a great aunt. Older relatives. And sometimes they don't really comprehend what a young person might want as a gift. So something happens you have an occasion and they give you a gift you unwrap it 
and it's a type of cologne that's sold by the court and smells like talcum powder, or it's like a shirt that's Wedgwood blue and has these sewn-on ladybugs all over it, and it's like, oh boy, what am I going to do with this? I wouldn't have the nerve to even put it on. Of course, I put it on while they were there and said, oh, thank you, this is so nice. Meanwhile, I'm thinking, Goodwill or Salvation Army or Purple Heart's going to see this by tomorrow morning. Because back then, remember, in the 70s, the silk shirts were the big thing, and the tight jeans, Jordache, Sergio Valente, and the motorcycle boots. You had to be dressed a certain way. You had to look cool. And let's face it, a cotton Wedgwood blue shirt with ladybugs on it was not going to cut it. It just not was not going to hold me to the image that I had always had. It wasn't a silk shirt. I appreciated the thought. The thought was there. They thought they were getting me something that I really wanted and something I'd really like. But again, by the next day, the Salvation Army or the Purple Heart had it. So that was the end of that. Now, the toys that we really wanted as kids, the gifts we wanted were always new bikes, skateboards. And you know what? Mom and Dad always knew to get us these things. Mom and Dad always got us the best gifts. And why would that be? Why would our parents always give us the best gifts? Because they knew us the best. Who would know us better than our parents, right? Now think about this. Our Father in Heaven and Lord Jesus know us even better than our physical parents ever could. So wouldn't it stand to reason that he would know the ultimate gifts to give us, his children? Gifts that won't wear out. They won't go out of style. They can't even be bought. They are ultimate. We know that the Lord gave us the gift of physical life. That's obvious, which is unbelievable to receive in itself. But think about this. What gift could our Father give us that even goes beyond that, our physical life? An eternal one. An invitation to spend our eternities in his kingdom with him. Now remember here, we're sinners by nature, and God the Father can't stand to even look upon sin. So before we can even accept his invitation of eternal life in the kingdom with him, he had to give us a special gift so that we could accept this invitation. And now what could that gift be? Let's really think about it. Or we could look into scriptures and even some of the ancient prophets prophesied in the Old Testament of the special gift that the Lord had to give us for us to receive before we could accept his invitation to get into the kingdom with him once our physical lives are over. For example, let's have a look at Isaiah 7 verse 14. It says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now let's jump to Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7, where it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Now let's have a quick look here at Zechariah 9.9, where it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now these scriptures tell us a prophecy that Jesus, the Son of God the Father, is coming to earth as a Messiah, as a Savior. But was just the fact that Jesus was coming to earth in physical form, was that the gift? Is that the gift that Father sent us? Was Jesus himself the gift that these prophecies were talking about? To a point, yes, they were. But remember, they were only part of it. Now, what do I mean by that? Only part of it. We know Jesus is our Lord and Savior. He was the gift that Lord Father sent to us so we could accept the invitation into the kingdom once our physical lives are over. But he gave us 
an example of how to live, what to do, footsteps to follow as God's children. That was part of the gift. What was the rest of it? What was the rest of the gift? The crucial part of the gift that Jesus had to fulfill was himself so that we could accept Father's invitation to live with him, but we had to be purged, remember? We are naturally born as sinners, so we have to be purged, forgiven, cleaned of our sins so that we can get into the kingdom and accept that invitation. And the only way that Lord Jesus could do this was to take all of our sins Every sin of mankind, I'm talking about from the first disobedience of Adam and Eve to the very last sin in the distant future that mankind hasn't even committed yet. He had to take all of these sins onto his shoulders, onto himself, and take our place being punished and crucified and killed for them. Basically, the Lord died in our place so that we can live in the kingdom with him and Father when our physical lives are over. And even that was prophesied. Think about it. Isaiah prophesied about the beatings that Jesus would have to endure for us. Take a look at that. Isaiah 50 verse 6 where it says, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Now if you'll think back, what did Lord Jesus go through when he was being taken to be crucified? He was beat, he was flogged, he was scourged, he was spit on, he was laughed at, punched in the face, you name it. They did it to him. He was severely beaten and tortured all the way to where he was to be crucified. So this scripture definitely foresees it. It prophecies that. And if we look at Zechariah 12.10, this tells us of when Lord Jesus would be pierced in the side. I will pour the house of David on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. So what does that mean? What's being said there? That prophecies. Lord Jesus being pierced, because remember, he had just died, but one of the Romans pierced his side to make sure he was dead, because anyone crucified had to be taken down by sundown at that point, because it was getting near the Sabbath, it was getting near a holy time, it was getting near Passover, and he was pierced. All through our physical lives, we give gifts, we receive them. But most of them are physical material things, of course. Now, that, that makes sense because we're physical and we're in a material world, so it's to be expected. But now we know that the most important gift, ultimate gift, a gift beyond measure of anything we could ever receive on earth, comes from our Father and our Savior, Lord Jesus. Father's gift is is his invitation to us to live in his kingdom with him and Lord Jesus for eternity, and his gift is actually Lord Jesus himself. Jesus came here in human form to show us how to live so that we can be like him and we can be like Father. Lord Jesus himself washed away our sins with his own blood. So basically, the blood of Jesus is also part of the gift. So there's a dual gift there, if you think about it. When Lord Jesus just came here, just coming here in human form to take on our sins and die for our sins, to give his blood to wash us of our sins was one part of the gift. And the other, of course, was during his ministry to show us how to follow in his footsteps, show us what he expects, what Father expects, so that we can live the right kind of life, we can follow him, accept him as our Lord and Savior, so we can get the ultimate gift of the invitation to get into the kingdom. Now we have to ask ourselves this, why? Why did Father and Lord Jesus do all this? We don't know how long it took them to really mastermind it and think it out and figure out how this was going to transpire and when in history it would, but why did they actually do this? 
Why did Father offer us this invitation into the kingdom? And why did Jesus and Father agree that Jesus himself will come down here to be the gift for us so that we can do it, so that we can accept the invitation? Because that's how much they love us. They want us in the kingdom with them forever, and to offer this invitation and gift is the only way they could make it happen. Jesus had to die on the cross and shed his blood for us so that we can get into the kingdom. But how do we accept the gift? Think about it. It's not just they offer us this and we say, okay, thank you, and everything's done. No, it doesn't work that way. We have to do our part. We're made aware of this invitation. We're made aware of the special gift of Jesus, but how do we accept it? How do we accept the gift and accept the invitation into the kingdom? There's only one way. And in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, what did Jesus mean by that? Although it's pretty obvious what he was saying. We have to accept Father's gift of eternal life in the kingdom, that invitation, by accepting Lord Jesus himself as our Savior, as our Lord, as our Creator, as our God. He actually redeemed us so that we can live for eternity with him and our Father in the kingdom. But this doesn't mean that we'll never sin again, does it? Not a chance. Let's face it, we're human. We're, as long as we're here, we're constantly going to be sinning. But because of what Lord Jesus did for us, we can now repent. And be sorry as long as it comes from the heart. We are then forgiven for those sins. They're wiped clean like a blackboard being erased and washed with a sponge. It has to come from the heart though. You can't superficially say, oh, sorry, Lord. And then go ahead and do it again and say, well, you know what? I can just keep doing this and keep repenting. And I can live the life I want the way I want. I'll just keep repenting of it. That doesn't work either. When we repent, we realize we sinned, we did something we shouldn't have, and we are authentically sorry from the heart. Because remember, the Lord can see into the heart. And we sin on a daily basis, but because of the blood of our Lord Jesus, that special gift from our Father and our Savior, we repent, we are baptized, we accept Lord Jesus as our Savior, and we'll receive the Holy Spirit, which is yet another gift. Now, remember what we said about parents giving the best gifts because they know what our needs are. They know what we really want. They really know us. Well, this tells us right here, nobody knows us better than Father and Lord Jesus. So when we repent, we're baptized, we accept Lord Jesus as our Savior, then we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for doing that. It's like an occasion, like a birthday or an anniversary or a wedding. When you're baptized and you repent, all of the angels in heaven are thrilled. They're rejoicing. It's an occasion. You have crossed a milestone. You have done something large, very large, and as a gift, we get the Holy Spirit. So we see here how the Lord showers us with gifts. And with the Holy Spirit, which is God's power, we receive the love, the strength, the mercy, knowledge, wisdom of the Lord, whatever he gives us. And remember, too, we don't just say, okay, I accept Jesus as my Savior, and we're done, and just go about our lives. Being saved, redeemed, and accepting this gift from our Father and our Savior comes with a big responsibility. And you know what? A lot of people don't tend to realize it. Being baptized and repenting and giving yourself to Lord Jesus Promising him that you will follow him, love him, obey him, live for him, that is not to be taken lightly. It's not an easy thing to do. It means literally turning your back on sin, on things of this world, and focusing your entire life, mind, heart, and soul on the Lord, on pleasing and serving and obeying the Lord. The commandments living and witnessing for Lord Jesus, because we know that the only way to the kingdom is through Lord Jesus. So we witness for him, just like the apostles did. We know that we have to shine a light to others, 
This is a very dark, corrupt, and dangerous world. We know this. So we also know that shining a light as a Christian, doing what we're supposed to be doing, walking in the Lord's footsteps, following the Christian path, is not going to be an easy journey, is it? But we also know that we're not alone. We have the Lord. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Bible. And we have each other. And of course, if you need me for anything, don't hesitate to contact me. All my contact information is right on my website. It's www.mychristianpath.com. Dot net. That's mychristianpath.net. Now, if you think about gifts, the Lord gives us so many gifts. He's given us the gift of our human lives so we can experience humanity, so that we can grow in faith. We can grow in spirit. We can grow in knowledge, wisdom, understanding, obey him. We can have the experience of humanity. He gives us eternal life. He gives us the invitation to get into his kingdom and Lord Jesus as a special gift to get there. When we reproduce and we have children, tell me that's not a miracle. Tell me that's not a gift. When you see a brand new born baby, that is a gift from the Lord. Now he gives us so many gifts and all during our lives, we have angels to protect us. We have the Lord to protect us. He's right there for us. He always was. He always will be. He's constantly giving us gifts. Where's children? People love to give their kids gifts. They love to make their kids happy. Well, don't you think the Lord loves to give us gifts? We're his children. He loves us. But what can we give him in return? I've thought about this before. For years, I'm thinking, you know, the Lord gives us so much. We owe so much to him. He is so loving. He is the best. But what could we possibly give the Lord that would mean anything? You can't buy him a shirt. You can't give him anything physical. You can't give him anything that you got that would meet. He owns everything. So what are we going to give the Lord in return? What gift could we possibly give him that would mean anything to him? Think about it. Love him with all of our hearts, minds, souls, and strength. Obey him. Keep his commandments. Be his children. Follow him. Please him. Be his saints. Have complete faith and trust in him with everything we have right down to our very last breath. And it's important to remember too, when the Lord gives us gifts, never love the gift more than the giver. If the Lord gives you some kind of a gift, whether it's a physical gift here or it's any kind of a gift, you never want to love the gift more than the person who gave it to you. It'd be like if your parents gave you a new bicycle when you were a kid and you love that bike more than you love mom and dad. Well, how do you think that's going to make your parents feel? So if we love a gift that the Lord gave us more than we love the Lord, how do you think that would make him feel? Don't you think he would be really hurt and upset? Of course he would. So we have to bear that in mind. It's important that through all the gifts that the Lord gives us, not only do we have to be very thankful and have a lot of gratitude to the Lord for them, but we have to love the Lord more than the gifts he gives us. Now, we know we're in the end times here. Just take a look around at the world. Look at what's going on in, in Asia and all these different countries over there. We know that persecution is going to get worse for us as Christians. It's all in prophecy. We know the Antichrist is coming, the beast, the rise of the beast. And you know what? It's going to get to the point where Christians will be outright physically in jeopardy of being killed for serving the Lord. And chances are that's going to happen when it comes time to make that big decision. Do we accept the mark of the beast or do we reject it? And we know what we're going to do. We, uh, we don't accept it. We reject the mark of the beast. We won't worship the beast. Well, then we pretty much have a target on our backs. We're marked for death, aren't we? And you have to admit, you can think about it now, but when the time comes, how scary is that going to be for us? It's going to be terrifying, but we have to bear in mind that they can only kill the physical body. 
we have to have faith in the Lord. And of course, staying close to the Lord, obeying him, pleasing him, serving him, and keeping our prayer lines open is extremely important during that time more than any. Just remember the gift that he gave us. The ultimate gift. Remember the invitation into the kingdom, which we won't get if we accept the mark of the beast, if we fold, if we cave in, even because of fear. And we know the Lord does not like cowards. Was the Lord Jesus a coward? I don't think so. Look at everything he went through, what they did to him, and then they ultimately murdered him. He was far from a coward. So how are we going to condone taking the mark of the beast, worshiping the beast, and turning and caving in because we're afraid, because we're scared for our lives, which of course is human. It's only natural. That's why we need the Holy Spirit to give us that power, that strength, so that we can do it, because we know there's no way in this universe we're going to do it without it. There's no way we can do it without the Lord, without the Holy Spirit. We have to stay in constant touch with the Lord. And remember when the Lord said, pick up your cross and follow me? What did he mean? Just pick up a physical wooden plank and walk around with it? No. Did he mean just be willing to accept some moderate persecution? Maybe. But when things get really down to the wire... Remember, the Lord was being crucified. When he was carrying his cross, he was on his way to be killed. So us picking up our crosses and following behind him could mean literally the same thing. We are being killed because we refuse the mark of the beast. We refuse to worship the beast. And we will not let go of our father. We won't let go of our savior. The Lord died for us. He was condemned to die for us. Our sins were forgiven. He died for us. The Lord Jesus' blood is the reason we can accept the Father's invitation to get into the kingdom. And we know we're going to sin, but as long as we are fervent, we keep repenting, we mean it, we have to stay on the Christian path. So times are getting very short. We know we're in the end times, and it's scary. You just look at the news. Look at what's going on in the world. You can see it on the internet. We know we're getting close to the end times. It is getting really scary. So it's crucial now. If you haven't already, repent, be baptized, accept the Lord Jesus as your Savior, follow in his footsteps, read your scriptures every day. It is important for us more than ever at this point in time to accept that ultimate invitation from the Father to get into the kingdom. And the only way we can do it is to accept the ultimate gift he sent us, Lord Jesus, and the blood that he shed so that we can accept this gift. So I don't mean being baptized here into any specific religion or denomination, just baptized in the name of Lord Jesus and stick close to the Lord. So keep your Bible glued to your side, read your scriptures every day, keep your prayer lines open, keep your faith strong, shine your light in this dark world as a testimony for Lord Jesus, and we will one day get into God's kingdom. We just have to stay strong, and we will make it. This is Reverend David from Christian Path Ministries. Until next time, my blessings. Goodbye, friends.